Yong Aseo, Huang Yong Habida, to Ralph Reeds. Brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe to the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On this edition of Ralph Reads, I present to you the finale of this harrowing miniseries, Black Gangster, by the incomparable Donald Goins. Uliga si jakacha. Let the reading commence. Chapter 19 The Silver Dollar Bar was just beginning to get into full swing. The news of Ape Man's death had put the bar's steady customers in a mood of gaiety, and the pimps and prostitutes were celebrating by buying out the bar. Frankie could be heard over the roar shouting loudly and cursing. Rack em back, goddammit! She screamed at the top of her voice, Give everybody a fucking drink on me! Three older pimps at a table in the rear watched the proceedings with misgivings. I don't know what the hell they're celebrating, one of the men said. Just because that stud got waxed, that ain't gonna stop us from having to pay protection dues. That ain't the half of it, one of his friends replied. Somebody's gonna have to pay for that killing. He hesitated briefly, then added, I hope to hell it ain't us. The pimp, who had started the conversation, nodded in agreement. I wasn't thinking about it in those terms, but now that you mention it, it's going to cost somebody more than a little piece of money. The third man kicked the speaker's leg under the table. Look what's coming through the door, man. You might just get an answer to your question faster than you realized. Preacher, followed by four men, wearing ruler uniforms, came into the bar and stopped at the entrance. His eyes fell on Frankie, pounding on the bar with a beer bottle. What the hell is wrong with you, Sam? She screamed at the bartender. Didn't I say for you to give everybody in the joint a drink on me? Now, let's get busy back there and serve it up if you want to make some money. Sam hurried up and down the bar as fast as his short legs will allow, pouring drinks. Okay, okay, he yelled back. I can't work any faster, so take it easy. The hell you say, Frankie yelled. If you can't work fast enough, I'll send one of my girls back there to give you a hand. Sam stopped what he was doing and glared at Frankie. The hell you will! I don't allow whores behind my bar! Bad enough, my bar's full of whores! If you want to get served, just hold your damn horses! You ain't in that much of a damn hurry! Frankie noticed Preacher, and the whiskey caused her to throw caution to the wind. She glanced briefly at him, then said, we don't get a chance to celebrate a punk's death every day, Sam, so hurry the hell up or I'll take my business across the street. You can take your girls any damn place you like, Frankie, only don't try rushing me. Preacher spoke up suddenly. Don't blow all your money across that bar, Frankie, because you got to pay dues for them girls of yours if you're planning on sending them to work tonight. A sudden silence fell over the barroom. Preacher turned away from Frankie and spoke to the crowd. Because of that accident, everybody will be expected to pay double dues tonight. Frankie flushed angrily. You better hope you can collect the regular dues, boy, instead of talking about somebody paying extra. Preacher grinned at her coldly. You don't have to pay a penny, Frankie, if you don't want to. I know damn well I don't, and I ain't about to pay either. Is there anyone else in here who feels the same way about this as Frankie? Preacher asked, glancing around the room. The silence had become so thick that you could hear the heavy breathing from a drunk in one of the back booths. 
Sam glanced around nervously. He knew just what was going on. He paid his protection dues too. Only they showed him a little more respect, like coming around early before many customers were in the bar. It was cheap, so he went along with it. He stared at Frankie and shook his head. Preacher nodded at one of his boys with a notebook in his hand. In that case, since no one feels like Frankie does, we can get on with our collection. As some of the girls whose men weren't there lined up to pay off, pimps began to fall in line behind them. When one of the collectors came up to a tall, dark pimp, the pimp asked sarcastically, How long are we supposed to go for this extra amount you guys have added on? Preacher spoke to the boy collecting the money. Give him his money back. The pimp stepped back from the collection table as though there were a snake on it. Wait a minute, Preacher, he stammered. That ain't what I meant. I don't want no money back. All I want to know is how long are we going to have to pay double rates? Preacher looked at the man steadily. If you want me to, Sonny, I could call up Prince and let you ask him yourself. That's all right, man, Sonny replied. I don't want no trouble I can't handle myself. Frankie's loud laughter rang out. She stared at Sonny as though he had come from under a rock. If that's what you whores call a man, this city is in real trouble. Suddenly, the old-time saloon doors swung open and a tall, ebony-skinned woman walked in. The platinum blonde wig she wore bounced on her shoulders as she crossed the floor with the stride of an African queen. She was noticeably young under her brazen whore makeup, but she carried herself like a thoroughbred. Frankie moved to the front of the bar and blocked her path. Come on, honey, and join me. I'd hate for one of these lightweight punks to try and fire at you and end up running you away. Preacher glanced twice at the girl before he realized that it was Ruby. To cover his astonishment, he spoke sharply to Frankie. If I was you, Frankie, I'd make sure didn't none of my girls try and work tonight because they might run into anything if you don't come up with that money. He waited, then added, You know what I mean, something like a sadist or some other kind of nut. Frankie threw him a murderous look, then grabbed Ruby by the arm and guided her toward the rear of the bar. One of you bitches give them punks some money, she said over her shoulder, glancing at her girls along the bar. Ruby caught Preacher's eye as she slipped onto a bar stool. Her tight black skirt rose up high on her thighs as she settled down, revealing a blood-red half-slip. With a small nod of her head, she motioned toward the door before one of Preacher's men should recognize her. Preacher got the hint and started to leave with his followers. One of Frankie's girls ran up and handed him $60. It ain't but four of us working tonight, but if that ain't enough, you can send someone back later on. We should be done broke luck by then, she said half belligerently. Preacher took the money and started towards the door. If we find out there's more girls working than what you said, I'll personally see to it that somebody kicks a mud hole in your ass, he told the girl. Frankie moved from her bar stool, then thought better of it and sat back down. The bar remained silent after Preacher had left. Frankie broke the silence, turning to Ruby. As you've heard, honey, they call me Frankie down here. She raised her hand and pointed to the girls at the end of the bar. All of them are in my stable. She laughed abruptly. It seemed as though I'm just about the only person down here that really wears pants. She pointed over her shoulder at the pimps who were glaring at her. You could say most of them are just punks in men's clothes. Her laughter rang out brazenly. Ruby smiled. All my friends call me Jamie, honey, she said easily. For a moment, she was fascinated by this loud, daring woman. She was well aware that it took a rare person to browbeat the pimps in his bar. They were all dangerous to a degree. 
when it came to taking any kind of shit from a woman, it hurt their pride. For Frankie to toss her contempt right in their faces was to skate on very thin ice. It wouldn't take but a slight nudge and the roof of the bar might fall in on both their heads. Ruby surveyed the place to see if anyone else might have recognized her. After they had downed a couple of straight whiskeys using water for a chaser, Frankie moved closer and began to rub Ruby's leg. When Ruby didn't protest, she moved even closer and began whispering hoarsely. Listen, Jamie, she began. I know where we can have a little privacy, if you'll agree. I don't know, Ruby answered hesitantly. Where did you have in mind we go? Frankie tried to put on a nonchalant air. It really doesn't make any difference, she said, but I would kind of like to go up to my place for a few drinks. Ruby pretended to be startled for a moment. Oh no, Frankie, I couldn't go for that. Suppose one of your girls came in while I was in there. Frankie waved one of her hands disgustedly. That's your least worry, Jamie. Ain't none of my girls going to show up, and if one of them did, you wouldn't have to worry about her saying anything. Ruby picked up the double shot of whiskey in front of her and sipped it slowly before replying, I don't think I want to go to your place, Frankie, but if you want to go over to my place, that will be marvelous. Frankie's arm began to tremble with excitement as she ran it higher on Ruby's leg. Saliva formed in the corner of her mouth and began to dribble down her chin. With a backward swipe of her hand, she cleaned her chin and stood up. Since you might want to come back later, honey, we might as well get the show on the road. Ruby slipped off her stool and stood beside Frankie. Ruby was tall for a woman, but when Frankie was beside her, she seemed actually short. The tip of her head barely cleared Frankie's shoulder. They walked out of the bar arm in arm. Frankie yelled at a passing cab in a heavy masculine voice. When they got in the cab, the driver looked twice and cursed silently. Ruby called out the address to him, then sat back in the seat. Wait a minute, baby, she said, pushing Frankie's hand from under her dress. We got all night, so ain't no reason for us to rush this thing. Frankie's breathing came heavy and loud in the silence of the cab. I hope you mean that, Jamie, about us having all night. The last thing I want to do is come back and sit up in that goddamn bar the rest of the night. Frankie stared at her in the darkness. This would be one hell of a cop, she thought. With a big, strong whore like this in her stable, there will be pleasant nights ahead. Ruby stopped Frankie from loosening one of the buttons on her blouse. She answered easily. If you don't be so goddamn impatient, honey, I might let you stay all night with me. If what I'm going through now is a taste of what I'd have to put up with the rest of the night, I don't think I'll be able to stand it. Frankie's eyes glittered dangerously in the dark. She made up her mind that once Jamie was in her stable, she would take some of the smart assness out of her. She imagined beating her with one of her huge belts and grinned. Yes, it would be enjoyable to take some of the starch out of this woman. The cab pulled up and parked in front of a shabby apartment building. The driver leaned over the back seat and took the money. As the women began to get out, he spit out the door past them. What the hell is wrong with you, mister? Frankie asked belligerently. The driver ignored the remark and pulled away from the curb. As soon as the cab moved out into the light traffic, Frankie glanced at the building and spoke to Ruby. You mean to tell me, Jamie, that as good as you look, this is the best living quarters you could find? She tossed a skeptical glance up and down the street, taking in the overturned garbage cans. Hmph, <sighs> she snorted. It's plain to see you need somebody to manage your business for you. 
That's why I came down to the bar tonight, Frankie. I was hoping I'd meet someone who could show me where to work in this city. I haven't been here but a couple of weeks, and I don't really know where to go. Ruby hesitated, then added, You know, the last thing I wanted was to hit the streets without someone able to bail me out if I took a fall. Don't worry, Frankie smiled. You came to the right place, and you found the right person. They entered the dimly lit building and started up the stairway. On the first landing, a wine head came staggering down the stairs. He lurched into Frankie, almost knocking her down the steps. Before she could regain her balance, he shoved her out of his way. She crashed against the wall, but as he tried to stagger past, she reached out and grabbed him by the shirt. Her right hand moved up and down in a blurring motion. The blows to his head sounded loud in the empty hall. With a sneer of disgust on her face, she tripped him and sent him falling the rest of the way down the stairs. His screams were still in their ears as they reached the second floor. Ruby stopped at a door and stuck her key into the lock. She stepped aside and let Frankie pass in front of her. Frankie stopped in the doorway and shook her whiskey-filled head as though some instinct warned her not to go any further. Before she could gather her wits, Ruby gave her a violent push from behind and she went stumbling into the room. Racehorse stepped from behind the door and hit her savagely upside the head with a nine inch blackjack. She slowly crumbled up and fell to the floor. The couple worked fast after that. In five minutes, Ruby emerged from the room and walked quickly down the hall to where a payphone hung on the wall. After making a hurried call, she went back up the hall to the front window. She pulled back the filthy curtain that hung across the cracked pane, rubbed some of the dirt off the glass, and glanced out. She waited patiently until she saw a small boy ride up on a bicycle and stop under the street light. Then she retraced her steps and went back to the room. Here, Ruby, Racehorse said, handing her a large brown grocery bag. Did you clean everything up? She asked in a subdued voice. Racehorse glanced at her nervously. Don't worry, Ruby. I took care of everything that needed taken care of. Well, she hesitated slightly, then started for the door. I'm gone then, baby. I don't think you need me for anything else. He didn't even bother to look up. Okay, baby, he said, speaking more to himself than to her. I think I'll go out the back door. Ruby came out of the building and walked quickly to the kid on the bike. Her heels rang out loudly on the pavement. Here, she said to him, take this bag up to the silver dollar bar and throw it under the door. Oh yeah, she added, there's no reason for you to be looking in that bag and don't forget that somebody will be watching you at all times. If you stop somewhere and start bullshitting, we will know about it. Don't worry, he said as he took the bag from her. I ain't gonna stop nowhere and I ain't gonna peep in the goddamn bag. Make sure you fucking don't, Ruby ordered and removed the $10 bill from her bra. This is for you, she pushed the money towards him. If you ever want to pick up some more easy money, make sure you do, just like you're told. Ruby started down the street as the kid went off on the bike. He rode for about 10 ghetto blocks before the bag began to get heavy. As he went to change hands with the bag, something thick and sticky oozed onto his leg. He began to pump the bike faster as the bottom of the bag began to give way. As soon as he turned the corner into the next block, he saw a neon sign with a large silver dollar on it flashing off and on. 
When he got to the door, he stopped his bike and grabbed the bag at the bottom with one hand in order to stop it from bursting. With one hand on the top and the other on the bottom, he flung the bag under the swinging doors, then rode away. The blood on his hand added speed to his flight. Inside the bar, the bag rolled over and over and came to a halt in the middle of the floor. The people sitting at the tables near the bar and those at the bar watched the bag bounce across the floor and come to a halt. A young prostitute, not older than 18, let out a scream as the bag opened and Frankie's head rolled out and propped itself on the severed neck in the middle of the floor. For the next 10 minutes, the bar became a place of horror as pimps and whores alike screamed without stopping. Chapter 20 After Donnie left the roost, he remained silent in the rear of the car. The news had already reached the kids in the clubhouse. Even though he hadn't known Frankie, he still felt a certain foreboding. It was impossible for them to continue getting away with wholesale murder. There was no doubt in his mind as to who was behind it either. He thanked his lucky stars that he only had to handle the homemade whiskey. That way, he reasoned, when the bus did come down, he didn't have too much to worry about. He figured the most he could get for the first offense was three years. And even so, he would still come out ahead of the game. Since he moved up in the organization, he'd been able to make enough money to buy his mother a house out of the slums. And for the first time in their lives, his brothers and sisters had enough clothes to wear. Donnie relaxed and stared out into the early morning darkness. Whatever happened... He reasoned he'd have to come out on top. Where else could he have earned enough money so that his mother would have $15,000 stashed away? He still smiled at the thought of her face when he had dumped the money in her lap. There would be no more standing in line at the clinic or waiting for checks or listening to sass from welfare workers. No more, he thought happily, would his mother have to wash other people's floors or accept hand-me-downs for her children. They even had insurance for each child in the family. Suddenly, the driver pulled up in the gas station that had been picked out for their meeting place. He glanced around quickly to make sure Danny hadn't shown up with the rental truck yet. Van, he said to the young man Prince had given him for a personal bodyguard. Fill the gas tank up first, and if they ain't here by then, pull over by the pop machine and we'll sip on some pop until they show up. The driver grunted and did as he was told. The boy sitting next to him in the front seat twisted around and spoke to Donnie. How long you think it's going to take us to get this goddamn still set up? Donnie shrugged. How the fuck would I know? I ain't never seen no whiskey still as large as this one. Donnie went back to staring out of the window. He didn't want to be bothered with stupid questions. His mind was too busy thinking over the money this new still would bring in. If everything went right, he'd be able to clear close to $20,000 in the next three months. He prayed quietly, not really believing his luck could hold that long. Lord, if you will only let me get in 30 more days, I ain't hurting nobody. And just look at the good I'm doing with the money. Please, Lord, don't let nothing happen for another month. And I'll see to it that my sisters and brothers all be in church every week. In fact, Lord, I'll start going every Sunday myself. But just please, Jesus, please help me to help these poor little black children that ain't never hurt nobody. He caught himself and glanced around quickly to see if anyone had noticed. The two men in the front seat were busy talking about some girls they had lined up, so he bowed his head and said amen. At the same time across town, Fox, fresh out of prison, was making preparations to leave. 
he had had two warnings from the Black Cougars to stop selling dope, but because he was Prince's pipeline, he had continued. He packed his bags with care. He glanced over at the two white envelopes full of money. Prince had given him $10,000 to make another buy with, but he had decided that his buying days were over. He had eight more pieces of dope that belonged to Prince, but he was going to sell them outright and put that money on top of the 10000 to take care of his traveling expenses. He grinned coldly, locked his suitcase, and placed it on the floor beside the other three. In a few more weeks, when Christmas rolled around, he'd be out on the West Coast with a pocket full of cash, while Prince ran around like a chicken with its head cut off, wondering what the fuck happened to his connect and his money. Fox opened the closet door and took down his overcoat. He laid it on his suitcase, then glanced at his reflection in the mirror. He drew in his gut. It wouldn't be too bad in one of those swimsuits, he told himself, and a little black rinse would eliminate the gray hair on his head. Fox glanced at his watch impatiently. He wished the hell his customer would pick that shit up. He wanted to get out of the Motor City as fast as possible, although he kept telling himself that he wasn't afraid of Prince. As far as he knew, Prince didn't have the slightest idea he was getting ready to run. It was damn well time anyway, he reasoned. The way things were going, it wouldn't be long before Prince's little playhouse came tumbling down. Fox carried his bags into the front room and set them down beside the door. He glanced at his watch irritably. He almost decided to take the dope with him and forget about the sale. But his anger had been aroused by the black cougars telling him he couldn't sell the dope in the city. He slammed his coat down and cursed. Wasn't no black son of a bitch is gonna stop him from selling dope if he didn't want to stop. He raved to the empty room. Common sense told him to forget about the sale. He could always get rid of the heroin somewhere along the way. But he thought about the dope houses the black cougars had cleaned up and cursed again. He wouldn't allow them the satisfaction of thinking they had run him out of town. A sharp knock on the door snapped him out of his thoughts. He opened the door slightly, keeping the chain on the door. He saw the man he was waiting for and unhooked the chain. Before he could step out of the way, the door slammed back against him. Chinaman came in first, followed by the tallest man Fox had ever seen. Fox backed up swiftly, but he wasn't fast enough. Before he could reach the shelter of the next room, the huge man caught him. The man's hand circled his neck, and he could feel his feet leave the floor. The hands tightened slowly as he wiggled frantically to break the hold. He beat like a child in the tight embrace of an adult. He kicked in vain as the black hands applied more and more pressure until he thought he had a band of steel around his neck. He never even noticed when Chinaman picked up the dope he had left out on the table and carried it into the toilet. The sound of the toilet flushing came to him, but it was too late. He would never hear anything again. Not a word had been spoken between the two men. They searched the apartment, then the body. The envelope inside Fox's coat was removed and each man took his share of the money. Then they left as they had entered and only the sound of the winter wind broke the silence of death. Donnie, still sitting in the back seat of the car, pointed at the truck cruising past the gas station. The driver of the truck hit his lights twice, then started to speed up. The car shot out of the gas station and began to follow the truck, unaware of the car already following the truck behind them. Donnie leaned over the front seat. Pass him, Van, so we can lead the way. The driver pressed down on the gas and Donnie waved out the window as they passed. The driver of the truck raised his hand to acknowledge the motion. It took less than 20 minutes for them to leave the west side and reach the north end of the city. They pulled up in a garbage littered alley, the lights of the lead car picking up rats of every size and description. Donnie's driver laughed as he turned into the backyard. 
The fence had been removed so that the cars and trucks could easily reach the house. The yard was barren of grass. It had been cleared out so that cars could drive in without any problems. On one side, boards and other rubbish had been stacked up out of the way. Further back, there were traces of where a barn used to be. Van parked the car on the side, leaving enough room for the truck to back up to the rear door of the small frame house. The men in the car climbed out and waited until the truck driver managed to back in. Danny jumped out of the truck, grinning. God damn, man! We would never have found this joint out here in the sticks! Donnie returned the smile, but only with his lips. His grayish eyes glittered with anger. He still couldn't get over the idea of Prince sending Danny along. He needed men who would help carry the goddamn huge whiskey still inside the house. And he knew from past experience that all Danny would do would be stand around and play with his pistol as though he were Al Capone. Donnie gritted his teeth and turned to the other men. Okay, guys, the quicker we get the damn thing in, the sooner we can go home. His voice was mild, but he always got the results he wanted. Men liked to work for him because he would always work beside them. He never stood around and just watched. The men opened up the back door of the truck. The huge cooker stood just inside the door. It was an old oil container, the type that can be seen in people's backyards or sitting behind farmhouses in the country. The only difference was that this one had been cut open, copper soldered around in the inside, then welded back together. Four of the men tried to lift it, but they just grunted under the weight. Donnie walked up on the porch and spoke to the boy standing in the open doorway. Bobby, we're gonna need all the help we can get. Is there anybody in the house besides you and your woman? Bobby, short and thin, shook his head. My old lady ain't even here. He pushed open the door and came out. We better prop the door open with something so we can carry that thing all the way in without stopping. He jumped on the truck while Donnie searched the yard for something to hold the screen door. God damn, Bobby exclaimed. I don't know if I want to try cooking with this big bastard or not. If I should blow up, man, I'll take the whole fucking house with it. Don't worry about it, Donnie replied as he put a brick against the door. As long as you watch it the same as you did the smaller one, it ain't gonna be no trouble. If you go to fucking around and don't take care of business, you might just end up getting blowed all the way to hell. I don't think you got nothing to worry about, Van yelled, leaning against the whiskey still. Cause I don't think we're gonna be able to get this big son of a bitch in the house. I guess y'all won't get the motherfucker in the house, Danny said, sitting down on the porch. If all you're gonna do is beat your gums about it. Donnie just rolled his eyes at Danny as he climbed up in the truck with the other men. Van, you help me with the back of this thing, man. The rest of you try to pick up the front. Bobby and the two other men moved to the front of the oil container. Why don't we push it to the edge of the truck, Donnie? Then we can get under it and carry it the rest of the way in the house, Bobby asked. The men pushed and pulled until they got it moving. Then three of them jumped off and waited until Donnie and Van got their end to the edge. Danny sat on the porch smoking. He grinned coldly as the men managed to get to still up and start for the porch, then stepped back as they made their way up the steps. They got as far as the door, then stopped. The still was still too large to go in the door. The fucking thing is too big, man. He ain't about to go through the goddamn door, Bobby yelled. Well, I'll be a son of a bitch, Danny said sarcastically. That's what I call being really bright. Here I am out here freezing my motherfucking ass off, and y'all come up with some shit like this. The men just gazed at the doorway as though looking at it long enough would make it wider. Donnie glanced around at the nearby houses. You guys keep your voices down. We ain't got no license to make whiskey, so just be cool. He stared up at the stars. It was still dark, but a tinge of light was beginning to break through. We got to figure out some way to get this shit through the doorway before daylight. 
He glanced at his watch. We still got a few hours if we work fast. The squares that live around here won't be getting up before 5.30 or 6. So please, let's get busy. Man, it's getting cold as hell out here, Danny complained, tightening his overcoat collar around his neck. Try doing some work then, Donnie snapped, then spoke to the other men. All we got to do is take the door frame loose. It should be wide enough then. Suddenly, a spotlight covered the porch. A loud voice ordered them to stand still. Don't move, the voice continued. We got the place surrounded. Before anyone could reply, Danny made his move. Donnie had started to raise his arms to surrender when gunshots exploded next to him. He glanced around, stupefied. You dumb bastard, he began, but something heavy struck him in the chest. He could feel himself falling from the porch as the night exploded in gunshots. Danny leapt from the porch, his gun spitting fire. He took two steps towards the alley, then fell as bullets struck him from every side. The other men on the porch were caught in the crossfire. Two of them had guns, but it was useless. When the firing stopped, they were stretched out on the ground. Donnie managed to climb onto his elbow. He could hear the sound of the policemen inside the house swinging their axes, destroying the barrels of whiskey mash. As his arms slipped from under him, he wondered idly what the noise meant. When the first policeman reached him, he had already left the world of fear and doubt. No more would he have to worry about the rent or whether he would be lucky enough to escape from the quicksand of his everyday life. Chapter 21 Prince sat at one of the front tables by the dance floor inside the roost. The clubhouse was crowded and swinging. People pushed and shoved to get near his table, and he smiled benevolently at his admirers. Everything was going as he had hoped. His only concern now was what was holding up Fat Daddy and Brute. He glanced at his diamond-studded watch. It was getting close to four o'clock in the morning, and again he wondered if he had made a mistake in moving against a highly organized trucking company. Through the din in the club, there came a loud thump on the door as if a drunk had fallen against it. Then it was repeated. Some of the crowd stood poised, ready to run if there was a bust. Before anyone could move, the sound of a car peeling rubber as it left the curb was heard over the roar of the record player. One of the doormen glanced out to make sure it wasn't a raid, then the other removed the bars from across the door. As soon as the door was opened, the bodies of Fat Daddy and Brute came falling into the clubhouse. A few mild screams were heard before the girl's companions could hush them up. Prince pushed his way through the milling crowd and stared down at the corpses of his two lieutenants. It looks like somebody beat them to death, Preacher said from behind him. There was no emotion in his voice. It was as though he were watching the movie on the late show. Prince stared in shock at the men at his feet. You three, Prince said, pointing his finger at the three men standing near. Take these bodies out the back way and drop them off. I don't give a damn where. Just make sure they ain't found near here. He swept the crowd with his cold stare. I want the rest of you to stay right here and keep on jamming as if nothing happened. Sometime this morning, you will get a phone call from me. And then you will go right into action without delay. He stepped back to allow the boys to pass with the bodies. Preacher, you come on with me and Ruby. We got a lot to handle before this day gets any older. He turned on his heel and walked out the door, followed by Preacher. They stood on the sidewalk feeling the morning wind blowing in off the river. 
What the fuck is holding that bitch? Prince was cut off by the roar of a powerful motor starting up. With the true street fighter's instinct, Prince jumped back down the cellar steps while Preacher, caught off guard slightly, moved towards his car cat-like. He dropped down and tried to roll under the car as a blast from a submachine gun awakened the neighborhood. Bullets ricocheted off the wall at the spot where Prince had been standing. As both men got to their feet, the dying sounds of the fleeing automobile could still be heard in the distance. The cellar door opened and frightened faces peeped out. What's happening out there? Someone yelled. Just close the goddamn door and keep on partying, Prince commanded. It was just some friends letting me know they had me on their mind, he added as Ruby ran up the steps. As Preacher opened the car door, Prince took Ruby's arm and steered her inside. No questions now, he ordered. Preacher started up the motor. He was a little shaken, but no worse from the incident. He put the car in drive and pulled away from the curb. Looks like somebody is playing for keeps, he said over his shoulder. Don't let it worry you, Prince replied from the back seat. I know just who the sons of bitches happen to be. You do, huh? Preacher asked, surprised. Prince's eyes flickered with rage as he leaned on the back of the front seat to answer. You better damn well bet I do. And before this day is over, they'll wish like hell they never heard of my name. Even as he made the boast, a small voice seemed to warn him to back up that things were getting out of hand, but he paid no heed. Ruby spoke up. I wasn't able to reach Danny or Donnie, Prince, but I got in touch with Hawk and Boss Game. They're both on their way, Daddy. He nodded and sat back against the cushions, his mind racing. If things continued as they were, he would soon be out of lieutenants, he thought coldly. Taking control of the city was getting to be a very expensive proposition. Preacher drove slowly down the side streets. By the time they reached the apartment, Hawk and Boss Game were just getting out of their car. They stopped on the sidewalk when they saw the Cadillac pull up, but Prince waved for them to go on in. The three occupants of the Cadillac glanced up and down the street nervously before getting out of the car and running into the building. Boss Game stood inside the building waiting for Prince. He asked, surprised, What's the matter, baby? The police chasing you or something? I'll run it down to you after we get upstairs, Prince replied as he brushed past him and continued up the stairway. After they were settled down in the apartment, Prince began... There's no reason for me to try to hide the truth. I'll bring it right out in the open, so everybody will know where we stand. The Mafia are behind the killings of Fat Daddy and Brute. Nobody fucking else, man. Just them. Just them, Boss Game exclaimed. Damn, that's too damn much right there. That outfit's too damn big for us to buck, Prince. We might as well face that right now. Prince glanced around at his top men. All he could see on their faces was agreement with what Boss Game had just said. What about you, Ruby? Do you feel the same way? Ruby glared around the room at Prince's lieutenants. There was nothing but contempt in her eyes. I don't sleep with Boss Game and the rest of these so-called soul brothers, Daddy, she replied dryly. Whatever you think is best, honey, you know I'll go along with it. Prince's mouth twisted into a harsh smile. Well, since I've got support from the thoroughbred in our organization, I do believe I'll play this thing the way I feel. First of all, I like to pull your coats to something I've always believed. The Mafia ain't shit in the ghettos, and I'll tell you why. If they come down here fucking around, we'll know them as soon as we see them. Ain't no woods coming around asking for no information without us knowing about it. So all we got to do is stay in our black neighborhoods and wait. 
If they try and hire some mean brothers to do the job, they'll have to hire an army, cause that's just about what we got. Prince stopped to let his words sink in. In the silence, Ruby spoke up. Even if they try and hire some brothers to do the work, they'd have to go out of town to get them. Cause ain't no niggas in their right mind here in the city gonna try and step on our toes. Prince could see that their words were having an effect on his men. Preacher, he said suddenly, I want you to have all your boys down in front of that warehouse in the morning before the first truck rolls in. He pointed his finger like a gun. Boss game, you and Hawk see to it that every gang we have at our disposal is down there too. And don't accept no fucking excuses. Tell them I ain't having no shit about this. I want every goddamn motherfucking one of them there. I want at least 500 boys and girls milling around there when those trucks start pulling in. I want you to pass out the order that not one of these trucks is able to pull off after you're through with them without the aid of a tow truck. Is that clear? Is that motherfucking understood? He waited until his men nodded in agreement. I don't want not even one to be able to drive away from there without the help of another truck. Then we'll see how the mafia likes it. He stared at his men, driving his words at them so they could feel his confidence. I don't believe that the Mafia, or anyone else for that matter, besides the police, can muster enough men to stop us if we stick together. The men started to talk among themselves. With the aid of the whiskey and reefer that Ruby passed out, their nerves were soon built up to such a point that they believed nothing could go wrong. It seemed foolproof now that Prince had shown them how it could be handled. As they left, they were joking among themselves about how the Mafia took it in the hip or under the arm. They went out into the streets full of confidence and did their work well. When dawn broke over the city, the first out-of-state trucks to enter the waterfront section were stopped two blocks from their destination. The drivers were removed forcibly from the cabs and the trucks completely wrecked. As the driver of the first truck fell into the milling crowd, he was kicked and stomped. In one hour, over 40 trucks were stopped and their drivers beaten. The police arrived on the scene, but the first two cars to show up were given the same treatment as the truck drivers. As soon as the police swanned over one area, the crowd moved to another block and continued to fight. Ruby, from a vantage point away from the fighting, made a quick phone call to the Black Cougar headquarters and told them that blacks were being beaten up all over the waterfront. The Cougars rushed men to the spot to help out their brothers, and soon they were committed to the battle because the police never changed their strategy. Their operation was simple. If it had a black head on its shoulders, try to knock it off. What had started out as a gang war had now turned into a rioting mob. Scores of teenagers broke into the neighborhood's warehouse and fought their way through the yards. Loot had become the password. As the boys fought, the girls would disappear with the goods taken to alleys they knew so well. Police began to arrive with dogs and riot guns. It took them a good hour to begin to restore order because as soon as they broke up the fighting on one street, it moved to another. A state bus arrived, then another, as police began rounding up the gang members. Even inside of the buses, they kept fighting in the aisles until the police fired warning shots at the ceiling. As the loaded buses pulled away, bodies of truck drivers could be seen up and down the street. Fire trucks moved back and forth trying to stop the fire blazes before they could spread 
Ambulances pulled away one after the other, carrying the dead and injured. Sometimes they carry police, more often teenagers or truck drivers. Morales shook his head sadly. They tell me that five truck drivers are dead, and before it's over, they figured to find at least three more in the same condition. Captain Mahoney nodded. That's the same count I got. Lieutenant Gazier came running up out of breath. He waited a second until he could speak. Well, I guess this about brings our case to an end. We picked up at least six different gang leaders, and before it's over, we'll probably have six more. With that many in the tank, somebody's got to start singing. The captain nodded. Yup, you're right about that. When one starts, they'll fall over each other trying to out-talk the next one. He stared around for a moment, then spoke to his two lieutenants. I want a first-degree murder warrant taken out on Prince, and each gang leader in our custody will be arraigned on the same charge. Find out just what gangs are locked up if we don't have the leaders in custody put out warrants for them too. Lieutenant Gazier grinned coldly. All right, Captain. It looks like that punk has finally made a mistake he won't be able to wiggle out of, huh? That's just about it, the Captain answered harshly. This is one jam five lawyers couldn't get him out of. There was a flash of bitterness in his voice. Morales, he said. Each one of you better pick up another partner. That way, you can cover more territory. I believe you two boys know more about these punks' hideouts than the rest of this motherfucking department put together. Gazier left to report the pickup on Prince, and Morales and the captain started back to their car. Just look at the damage these punks have done. The captain pointed at two trucks still smoking from where gas had been poured over them and set on fire. Morales, I'd bet it's over a hundred thousand dollars worth of damage to those trucks alone, without counting what's been done to their cargo. Say, Pat, Morales said, stopping and pointing. Look over there, will you? Looks like one of Prince's top boys on that stretcher. The policemen hurried over and stopped the men with the stretcher. The kid lying on it had a bandage around his head that didn't quite cover the gaping wound. When he stood looking down at him, one of the male nurses stepped forward and pulled the blanket over his face. Well, this is one that won't be in any more street fights, the nurse said flatly. That's the end of boss game, Morales said. What do you think happened to him? I don't think I know, the nurse replied. We found the truck driver who swung the iron pipe right next to him. His friends took care of the truck driver, but he made sure before they got him that he would have plenty of company in hell. The nurse nodded towards the stretcher coming up behind him. Morales walked over and pulled the cover from the second kid's face. He quickly covered it back up and turned away to avoid being sick. There's no reason for you to look, Pat, he said when he regained his composure. That's little Larry on that one. Looks like he would have been better off staying in jail. Morales started walking towards the car. Captain Mahoney caught up with him and grabbed his arm. There's no reason for you to let this upset you, Morales. If the boy hadn't been here fighting, this would have never happened to him. It's hard to think that way, Pat, when you see a kid not even 18 years old with his whole face bashed in. Before you go and get soft-hearted, Morales, think about that poor truck driver who probably had two or three kids at home. Try thinking about that. Try thinking about what you tell his wife. Pat, I know these kids are in the wrong. Don't think I'm trying to find excuses for them. It's just that I hate to see kids throwing their lives away at such a young age. They're old in their way, Mahoney replied unrelentingly. Yes, I realize that they're old, Pat. But the way things have been going, three murders last night and now this, we might as well put on their epitaph when we bury them. The old die young. Mahoney rubbed his nose with the back of his hand. Lieutenant, if we don't catch up with Prince soon, 
we're going to bury a whole lot more of these kids because it's a sure bet that the Mafia won't take this without some kind of retaliation. Don't worry, Captain. We'll get them, and it won't be long. I got a feeling you better make it real quick, son. And I mean real quick. Chapter 22 it was afternoon now, and the streets had been cleared of the wreckage. The fighting had been over for some time, but the warehouse across the street from the trucking concern was still smoking. Inside the Teamster office, a big man smoking a thin cigar was pacing the floor. Every time he glanced out the window, he became angrier. I'm gonna give you one more chance, Ed. You and Bill fuck this deal up, so I'm going to see if you can straighten it out. He gestured impatiently with a cigar when Bill tried to interrupt. I don't want any more of your goddamn excuses. You're not dealing with nothing but some young punks, and your stupidity is going to cost us over $300,000 worth of damage. Boss, it's not how you think it is, Ed replied, his voice trembling. The kid that gives these punks their orders is smart. The cigar was pointed again. Of course the kid is smart. Maybe I should give you over to this kid, then let him take care of your job. Now, just shut the fuck up, the boss man roared. I said I don't want any excuses, and I fucking mean it. You got three days to get that boy. Three days! This time, make sure you don't knock off any small fry like those two you killed and started all this trouble. I want you to get the top man in three days, or we'll replace you with someone who can do the job. Across town in Tony and Racehorse's penthouse, Prince sat brooding over the day's events. Every time the television came on and his photo flashed across the screen, he realized bitterly that he had made an awful error. His organization had come tumbling down around his head. If he had only thought out the matter more carefully, things would have been different. All he would have had to do was back up, forget about what happened to Brute and Fat Daddy. Common sense should have told him he was overreaching. Now the only course left to him was flight. With his picture on everybody's mind, he'd have to leave the damn country. Tony got up and switched the television back on. The newsman was just wrapping up an announcement on the arrest of some black cougars during the riot. He continued to speculate on a possible alliance between the cougars and the organization behind the latest outbreak of killing. That's good for them bastards, Ruby said, laughing harshly. Now all we got to do, Prince, is get us on a big iron bird and fly the fuck away from here. In another week or two, the white folks will be done forgot all about you as they nail them cougars black asses to the fence. I see that bitch is still trying to think for you, Prince, Racehorse said arrogantly. His contempt for his associate was barely concealed. It showed in his laugh, in his attitude, as he continued. In fact, baby, you really ain't got no problem. If you'll just stop listening to your woman for a minute, I'll explain something to you. Maybe you got something there, Prince replied slowly, hiding his rising anger. He smiled, but his eyes were chilling. You go on and explain it to me, horse, but leave my woman the fuck out of it. How we get along with each other doesn't concern you. Racehorse laughed. Maybe you're right about that, he said easily. You can get out of this shit with your ass still in good shape, Prince, if you don't mind spending a few dollars. I gotta connect in Florida, where the guy will smuggle you across to Cuba in his boat, but it will cost you a nice piece of change. I got a few hundred dollars head away, Prince answered. Your ass, Racehorse snorted. If you and Ruby ain't got over 50 grand head away, you ain't got shit. If we got a hundred thousand head away, it ain't none of your motherfucking business, Ruby said loudly. If looks could kill, 
Racehorse would have been dead. This son of a bitch thinks he's smart, Prince. We don't need no telling. If the bastard has a connect that will help you, that's cool. But ain't nobody gonna kiss his black ass to get along with him. Racehorse threw up his hands. See, that's what I mean. Your bitch has got too much mouth. What she needs is a good old-fashioned ass-kicking. Then she'll be in her place. Tony spoke up before the argument could get out of hand. All this arguing ain't gonna help anybody. Whatever you say ain't gonna change the fact that you got big problems, Prince. If Racehorse has to connect for getting you out of the country, you better listen to him because you're hot as hell. That makes sense, Tony, Prince said softly. I'd like to see an end to this fussing as much as anyone else. He got up and walked to the window. It's a sure thing we won't be able to make a move before it gets dark, though. He stared out of the window quietly, filled with bitterness. He promised himself that he never allowed them to put him behind bars again. No, it would be better to hold court in the streets, no matter where they stopped him. He turned back to the room. It won't be much longer before it's dark. Then, Ruby, you can slip out and pick up the money. We might as well try to get away tonight. The man would like to get his hands on Ruby just about as bad as he'd like to get a hold of you, Prince, Racehorse said. I don't think there's any heat on me and Tony, though, so why don't you pull our coat to where the money is and let us pick it up for you? Ruby laughed sarcastically. I wouldn't trust you with my mammy's bloomers, let alone a big piece of money, racehorse. I don't know what makes you say shit like that, bitch, racehorse answered quickly. You should know we wouldn't burn Prince. Why, we couldn't afford to. He's the only person who could bust us, so you know we treat him right. Tell me the blind can lead the blind or that a fly can fuck an elephant, Ruby shot back. But don't bring us this weak shit about who you won't burn. You burn your mammy for her last days on earth if you thought you could get them. So take that bullshit to someone whose head screws on. Racehorse glared at Ruby. The hell with what that bitch is talking about, man, he said angrily. What do you think about the idea, Prince? Damn what your cunt is talking about! Before Ruby could reply, Prince cut her off. Shut up, Ruby. I'll handle this. He turned to Racehorse. Whatever she said, Horse, I'll just about go along with. What's to keep you two from running off with my money once you get it? You done told me you gotta connect to get into Cuba. So what the fuck? He waved his hand to avoid an interruption. I'll tell you how we can do this. I'll give you 20 grand for going with Ruby to pick up my money, racehorse. And to make sure you don't burn me, leave your motherfucking gun here. Racehorse cursed. Fuck that shit! Prince shrugged. Ruby, take a hundred dollars and buy you a wig. Maybe you can slip into the apartment that way. It will be a hell of a lot cheaper. Racehorse changed his mind quickly as Ruby stood up. Okay, baby, I'll go for it. He removed his pistol and held it out to Prince. Prince gave the gun to Ruby. When he goes into the apartment, honey, I want you so close to him, you'll look like you're part of him, you understand? She nodded her head. Okay, daddy, but I'll still stop and pick up that wig before we go to the apartment. Prince sat back down. Okay, baby, do it like you want to. Just make sure you take care of the business. We ain't got no room for mistakes this late in the game. Don't worry, honey, she answered as she followed Racehorse from the room. I'll be back as soon as possible. Across town in another apartment, Preacher was rushing his wife. Hurry up with that goddamn packing, he yelled. I done told you we ain't got no time. Just bring what you can for now. You can have your mother pick up the rest of this fucking stuff. He glanced at his watch. Hurry up, goddammit! His youthful brown-skinned wife came running out of the bedroom with a suitcase. She put down the suitcase in the middle of the floor next to two others. I ain't got but one more to pack, honey. Just wait a minute, she said and started to turn around. Preacher snatched her arm. His eyes were wild. 
Can't you get it through your fucking head, woman? We got to get the fuck out of here now! Not later, but right now! He pulled her by the arm and pushed her towards the door. She stumbled, then straightened up. As she reached the door, there came a thundering knock from the outside. Preacher dropped the suitcases in the middle of the floor as his woman backed away, her face filled with fear. Suddenly, the door came crashing in. Preacher's wife began to scream in terror. As the police came rushing into the room, Preacher raised his hand and screamed over and over, Don't kill my wife! Don't kill her! She ain't done nothing! Please don't kill her! The first policeman to reach him knocked him to the floor. If you move, nigga, I'll fucking kill you, he growled. The officer stood over him with a gun pointed at his head. Preacher's wife raced across the room and grabbed the policeman's arm. Don't kill him, she screamed, trying to knock the gun from his hand. God damn it, the officer cursed, trying to fight her off with one hand. Before one of his partners could step in to help, the gun went off. The slug hit Preacher in the middle of the forehead. He fell onto his back, dead, before he reached the floor. In the ensuing silence, one of the officers cursed. I'll be a son of a bitch, he said to no one in particular. Preacher's wife fell across his body and began to sob. The officer who had pulled the trigger kept repeating, I didn't mean to shoot him. I didn't mean to shoot him. I didn't mean it. The rest of the policemen stood dumbfounded. It had taken everyone by surprise. Ruby took her time picking out a strawberry red wig. When she had finished making her purchase, she strolled around the store slowly so that when she left the shopping center, it would be dusk dark. Racehor sat on the passenger side of the Cadillac chain smoking. God damn it, you didn't have to take off fucking night, did you? His voice was edgy from the strain of waiting. She slid under the steering wheel without bothering to answer. Racehor stared at the expanse of beautiful black thigh as her skirt inched up higher. I thought the only thing you liked was snow, Racehorse, she said coldly, glancing at him from the corner of her eye. My thigh ain't nowhere near white nigger, so you might as well stop fiending on it. He laughed shortly, then reached over and put his hand high up on her thigh. You know, Ruby... You and me might be able to work something out. He waited to see if she would interrupt, then continue. I know there ain't no heat on me, and I don't think there's too much on you. Racehorse stopped talking and worked his hand higher on her thigh. Ruby dropped one of her hands from the steering wheel and removed his hand from her leg. Whatever you trying to say, you might be able to say it better if you would just try concentrating on it instead of trying to stick your hand under my dress. Well now, I might at that, but I enjoy it better this way, he replied as he began to feel her leg again. Ruby, have you ever thought about pulling up on Prince? She shrugged her shoulders. What woman hasn't ever given in to the thought of leaving her man? The ambiguous answer seemed to satisfy a racehorse. Why don't you try thinking about it now then? When we pick up that money, Ruby, ain't nothing between us and that airport but air. The idea of pulling up with the money had occurred to him the moment Prince had told him to go along with Ruby to pick it up. The idea of taking her along was only a temporary measure until he could get his hands on the gun. Then he'd make other arrangements. The thought of making love to Ruby was pleasant enough, but the idea of staying with her was madness. He couldn't stand a willful-minded woman. She grabbed his hand again, but this time she clawed it deeply with her fingernails. He snatched it back with a yell. Next time, find you something else to paw on, she said, spitting the words out. I told you once, nigga, ain't nothing about me should remind you of snow. And since you're so mad about white bitches, you better find you one of them to put your funky hands on. Racehorse moved across the seat and stared at the scratches on the back of his hand. 
they made the rest of the trip in silence, and he thought of how to get his gun away from her. He wanted that money, as well as the joy of killing Ruby. She parked the car a block away from her apartment building. They walked together up the sidewalk, each involved in their own thoughts. When they reached the building, Ruby pointed the way to Racehorse, then followed him up the stairs. She gave him the key and stood back as he opened the door. Before he could move out of the way, she kicked him in the back, sending him falling through the open doorway. Well now, pretty boy, she said slowly as he lay at her feet. You done any thinking of how we should rip my man off for his money? Cause that shit about you and me didn't work out too well. He pushed himself up on his hands and glared up at her. The pistol in her hand didn't waver. It was pointed directly at his head. He stared up at her. Her eyes were black chips of ice. They glittered with an unholy light that made him tremble uncontrollably. Wait a minute, Ruby. I was just kidding with you, girl. You know I know you ain't gonna leave, Prince. I was just playing woman, that's all. She started laughing. A wild, almost hysterical sound. She walked past him and picked up a cushion. Before he could raise any higher than his knees, she whirled back around. The sound of the shot was muffled by the cushion, but she fired twice more. Racehorse slipped back to the floor, trying in vain to raise his hand. Blood gushed from the corner of his mouth as he lay stretched out on his back. All of the gunshots had hit him in the chest and stomach. Ruby watched him for a minute, then disappeared into the bedroom. She came out carrying a black bag. She stared down at the body once to make sure he was dead, then slowly let herself out the door. She glanced up and down the hallway, making sure no one had been drawn by the noise. Her high heels mingled with the noise from the other apartments as she ran downstairs. A chill wind was blowing as she stepped out on the street and she clutched her collar around her neck. The black doctor's bag she carried was stuffed with money. As she neared some dilapidated storefront buildings, she clutched the bag tighter. Wineheads and junkies loitered in front of the stores. Normally the sight of gangs didn't disturb her, but because of the large amount of money she carried, her nerves were on edge. After the first glance, the junkies ignored her and went back into their nods. As she neared a group of men who were passing a wine bottle back and forth, a young drunkard staggered into her path and tried to wrap his arms around her. Removing her hand from her coat pocket where she held the gun, she gave him a hard shove in the chest. The unexpected push sent the man down hard. He climbed back to his feet cursing as his friends laughed. He shook a clenched fist after her, but it was too late. She had forgotten about him before he was out of her sight. Her real concern had been the addicts. Ruby relaxed and breathed more slowly after she reached the car. She jumped in and locked all the doors. She glanced oddly at the black bag. For the $60,000 inside that bag, the addicts would have killed their mothers, let alone her. Chapter 23 Prince stared moodily out of the window. Ruby should just about be on her way back, he thought impatiently. The sound of a phone ringing came to him sharply. He listened absent-mindedly as Tony talked into the receiver. Just a minute, he heard Tony say before he hung up. He went into the bedroom and closed the door behind him. Prince stared at the closed door. Tony's curious behavior hadn't escaped his notice from the corner of his eye. He had seen the fleeting glances Tony sent his way. He stared for the bedroom door, but stopped. If something had happened to Ruby, his barging in wouldn't do any good. If Racehorse has hurt her, I'll hunt both of them down if it takes a lifetime, he promised himself. As he stood in the middle of the room, undecided, he heard Ruby's soft, arranged knock. 
he rushed over and opened the door. After finishing his conversation in the bedroom, Tony hung up the phone. He walked over to his dresser and slowly pulled out one of the drawers. It was unbelievable, he told himself. Luck didn't generally fall his way this easily. His uncle, a higher up in the mafia, had called him. They were trying to find out where Prince had holed up. They wanted him so bad, they were willing to pay 50,000 big ones for whoever made the hit on him. Tony grinned coldly. That was 50,000 racehorse wouldn't be up on. He'd handle this one himself. With everybody in the city searching for Prince, he had the man under wraps. When Tony stepped through the bedroom door, he was surprised to see Ruby, but it didn't cause the pistol in his hand to tremble. He held the gun lightly, pointed in Prince's direction. Well, well, I see we have our little lady back, he began. What happened to old horse? I'm surprised he allowed you out of his sight with all that money. What's the gun for? Prince asked sharply. I thought you were too big to start playing cops and robbers. Tony glanced down at the gun. No, no, I wouldn't say I was playing kid games. Let's just say this is the instrument I'm going to use to get big stuff. Tony grinned, revealing beautiful teeth in his tanned face. To begin with, Ruby, you bring that bag of sweet green things over here. That was as far as he got. Ruby glanced up at Prince before firing through her coat pocket. The bullet struck Tony high in the chest. As he fell back, the automatic in his hand went off. Prince lurched from the impact. Ruby came out of her pocket with the gun and fired again, this time hitting Tony in the face. As he slid down the wall, she pulled the trigger twice more. But the gun snapped on empty cylinders. Baby, baby, you all right? She asked frantically as she turned to Prince. He was clutching his stomach and leaned against the door. She stared at the slowly spreading blood, her eyes wide. Just hold on, Daddy. I'll get something to bandage it up with. We ain't got the time, woman, he managed to say. We got to get the fuck out of here. Those shots must have been heard by everybody in the building. She nodded. Okay, Daddy, I won't take but a moment. She ran into the bedroom and snatched the sheet off the bed. As she came out, she bent over and retrieved Tony's gun, slipping it in her coat pocket. They left the apartment together. Prince had his arm around her neck for support. A few people glanced out of their apartments as they passed, but no one tried to stop them. Prince pressed the bundled up sheet against his wound as they made their way to the street. Ruby helped him into the Cadillac. After getting him settled, she walked around to the driver's side, glancing up and down nervously. Damn it! She swore under her breath. I'll still have to get rid of this goddamn car! She frowned, troubled. She had to get Prince somewhere safe before even attempting to pick up another car. Prince rolled over on the car seat, holding his stomach. He listened to Ruby's words, but didn't hear them because of the pain, the burning fire inside his stomach. Ruby glanced down at him as she drove. He had to have help fast, but how? Her brain raced with only one thought. How could she help her man? Time, she reasoned, was precious. She didn't have time for aimless driving, so why was she doing it? She turned onto a side street and parked between two cars. She leaned over and examined the wound. It was the first close look she had of the wound. Oh, Daddy, please, Daddy, what am I going to do? She was a lost woman, clutching at the only thing she believed in in life, her man. Tell me, Daddy, tell me, what? He could hear her voice. He understood. He could feel her hands on his face. She kissed him clutched his head to her bosom, almost smothering him in her fear. Tears ran down her face. Can you understand me, darling? She murmured in his ear. I'll get you a doctor, Daddy. Don't worry. I'll have one as soon as I find one. She fingered the gun in her coat pocket. It wouldn't be impossible to walk a doctor out of his house. That was her least worry. She rested his head against the door. Daddy, Daddy, I got to take you out to your grandmother's. 
Prince, you hear me, Daddy? I got to get you to your grandma's so I could go get the doctor. Her voice was husky. She prayed fervently as she drove. Feverishly, she picked out gaps in the traffic and sped through the night. Prince managed to regain consciousness enough to speak. It's up to you, Mama. It's up to you, he murmured, his voice drifting off. She stared down at him, her face glistening from the steady flow of tears. Don't worry, baby, don't worry, she managed to reply. She pulled up in front of the old house and parked. The street was deserted. The winter wind had driven most of the inhabitants inside. The isolated people she saw were scurrying for the warmth of their shabby dwellings. Ruby managed to get Prince's arm around her neck. She was able to support most of his weight as they made their way to the porch of their rundown house. She pounded on the door, her eyes searching the street for prowling police cars. Child, what done happened to you? The elderly woman cried as she came out the door. Together, the two women managed to get Prince inside and stretched out on the sofa. Prince's grandfather watched the proceedings with a cold stare, cursed suddenly, and stood up. I told you, Ma, when we was watching TV and that boy's face came on the screen, that he done went and got in more trouble than he could get out of. He walked over and looked down at Prince. There was no compassion in his face. I done spent 90 years in this world, and I ain't never been inside no jail. Ruby stood up and spoke to the old woman. You will watch him for me, won't you? I got to get out of here and run down a doctor somewhere. We don't need no nigga here that all the police department is looking for. The elderly man ran his fingers through his kinky snow white hair. Ain't having no trouble out of no white folks because of that boy there. Ruby glanced at the old woman. Don't worry, child. I'll take care of him. Don't you worry none on what that old fool is saying. He know I'm going to take care of this boy. You just hurry up and get that doctor. That's what you do. You just hurry on along. Ruby leaned over and kissed Prince. When she got up, she pecked the old woman on the cheek. I'll be back as soon as possible. She glanced again at Prince before going out the door. As the sound of the closing door faded, Prince pulled himself up and clutched at his grandmother's arm. It hurt so, he gasped. Then he laid back and died. There was nothing heroic in his death, just the passing of a boy who would never have the chance to see 25. The two old people began to weep, tears of frustration and despair coursing down their cheeks. For the grandfather, it was the last of his bloodline. The youth he had treated with such callousness was gone. For something to do, he picked up the black bag Ruby had left behind and threw it into a corner, out of the way. Lieutenant Gazier was quiet as the detective car moved in and out of traffic. The trouble was coming to an end, yet he hadn't been able to find that incident that would bring him the recognition he longed for. All it would take was a small break. Whoever got the opportunity to arrest Prince would make all the headlines, and that would guarantee a boost in his career. Suddenly, he sat bolt upright in the seat. He turned around and stared at the white Cadillac they had just passed. Turn around and catch up with that caddy, Gazier ordered. The uniformed officer quickly threw the car into a U-turn and fell in behind the Cadillac. Ruby watched the movement in her mirror. She knew at once that it was a police car behind her and quickly ran over her chances of escaping the bust. If it was an officer who didn't know her, she had a chance. To try to escape in the Cadillac was insane. The police car was smaller and faster. She decided to bluff. She didn't believe there was a pickup out on her. She pulled over and parked with the motor running. The police car came up, passing slowly. Ruby stared hard at the officers, trying to see if she could recognize them. She couldn't see their faces, but the officer driving was in uniform. Her heart skipped a beat. It might be the break she'd been looking for. She waited for it patiently. That was all they needed. One good break, and she and Prince could still pull out of trouble. When she was just about to believe they were going to leave her alone, the police car stopped. 
Ruby reacted as the officer on the passenger side jumped out. She removed the pistol from her coat pocket and rolled down the window. Lieutenant Gazier almost ran around the police car. He thought he had recognized the driver. He didn't want to believe his luck was so good. She would be even better than her boyfriend. Because with her, he would end up with both of them. Woman or not, he promised himself. He'd get his information from her before they got to the station. He was still smiling when he reached the Cadillac. Ruby, recognizing Gazier, fired point blank into his face. As the body of the detective fell beside the car, she plunged her foot on the accelerator. The car leapt away. Before the other officer could react, the Cadillac was almost past him. He drew and fired wildly. Two of his shots crashed through the side window. The car swerved and struck a fire hydrant. Silence prevailed for a brief moment. Even the streets seemed to be bidding farewell. Ruby twitched on the car seat, blood gushing from a head wound. For one brief instant, life held her and she thought, what will my man do now? We have reached the end of this Donald Goins miniseries on Ralph Reed's. I would like, or rather love, to thank my queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You could contact me on Facebook, Ralph Anthony Garcia, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope at RGMC2407. Email me rgmc2407 at gmail.com where if you would like to leave a small donation please use the Zelle app or paypal.me forward slash rgmc2407 or the cash app my cash tag is rgmc2407 you can also find me on my other channel rgmc ralph garcia master of ceremonies and right here on this channel on the united ronin networks we are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I will see you fellow sexy people in the next edition of Ralph Reed's Gamzabida.